What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. Okay, so we are picking up with Doomsday Clock Part 2, and really, in order to keep from, like, spoiling the events of The Watchmen, because I know that while the story is, like, 50 years old, or 40 years old, or something crazy like that, a lot of people never read it. I mean, they saw the movie, but they never actually read the comic. So in order to keep from spoiling the end of the comic, we're not going to go too deep into what the aftermath of the comic is, or at least what happens at the end of the comic. What we will say is that with regards to where Doomsday Clock picked up, it basically picked up with the end of the world, the fact that everything had come crumbling down. And so really, this deals with like these, these last vestiges, these last moments. But for reasons that were never really explained to us, Ozymandias had gone as far as to basically recruit the characters of Marionette and Mime. Now remember, Marionette and Mime were in a lot of ways the, not really Joker characters, but characters that were kind of like homages to Jokers. Now in truth, the way there's the way they're kind of being depicted here, it's almost like they're more of a Joker-Harley Quinn relationship in the sense that I would say Joker would be more like Marionette and Harley Quinn might be more like Mime. But we didn't really know why Ozymandias wanted them so much. We don't know why he brought them in. Well, what we end up doing is get this kind of tape. Of course, Ozymandias basically gives them back the things they normally need, their, their outfits, perfume for, for Marionette, different things like that. But we end up, you know, having this tape that's shown to Rorschach. And what this tape reveals is that somewhere along the line, over the course of the careers of Marionette and Mime, they had gone to rob a bank. Now, of course, this bank robbery really kind of played out the way we would expect it to in the sense that things went nuts pretty fast. But along the way, they're basically greeted by the arrival of Dr. Manhattan. Now, the crazy thing about this is that Dr. Manhattan would have just incinerated them in their entirety. And that was the expectation, you know, from like the bank manager, from the bank tellers, the customers who were in there, they expected Dr. Manhattan to just obliterate Marionette and Mime in their entirety. The problem is that Manhattan chose not to. And the reason why was because he basically realized that Marionette was pregnant. Now, of course, we talked about this in the first video. And in fact, that's one of the biggest things that's hit on in the first video is that Marionette and Mime had a child and they wanted to know where it was. I mean, there's a, there's a point in the first story where she's like, where's my baby at? So of course we know that you know that they that they have a child together, but it is cool because one of the things that's really kind of focused on when it comes to Manhattan is this sort of lack of concern about humanity, this lack of interest. But one of the things that really kind of also focuses on in the original Watchmen is that if Dr. Manhattan is being human, he's really being human in name only, in the sense that, well, this is what humans would do, so that's what I will do. Like it's these little you know, these little tidbits of humanity that are still somewhat part of his person and kind of leak out here and there, so to speak. But the funny thing about this is that Adrian Veidt didn't know that. Ozymandias did not know that Marionette was pregnant. You know, Ozymandias looks at that and says, well, Manhattan chose not to kill him because there's some kind of connection they share or something along those lines. It's desperation. Where Ozymandias is the smartest man in the world, what he's doing is grasping at straws. The world is coming to an end and we have to find Dr. Manhattan in order to save it. He's the only one that can do it. And I'll believe anything I need to believe in order to find him. In times of desperation, people will believe whatever they want to believe, whatever will make them more comfortable. Even if that belief system defies all forms of logic, if it defies all forms of evidence, they will move those facts aside and they will replace those facts with their own opinions because it makes them feel better about the reality of the situation. That's the nature of things. Now, the other thing about this is that Ozymandias also came to the realization that Dr. Manhattan glowing blue is just a byproduct of electrons escaping his body, but what it does is it leaves a trail. And so the argument of Ozymandias is they can literally follow it like breadcrumbs and they can find out where it is that Manhattan went to. Because with Ozymandias' explorations and his, you know, investigations, he's found nothing to indicate that Dr. Manhattan has moved to some other place in the universe. In the mind of Ozymandias, he's gone to a different universe, presumably the main DC universe. And so the result is that as these bombs begin crashing down around everyone, we ultimately end up having the Watchmen, Ozymandias and Rorschach alongside Mime and Marionette, basically teleport to the DC universe. And it's actually kind of cool because what it does from here is it picks up with Bruce Wayne. Now, one thing I want you guys to remember is that Doomsday Clock is believed to basically take place after everything that's going on so far. So Doomsday Clock takes place after all the current stories that are going on in DC Rebirth right now, after the events of Dark Knight's Metal, all is really kind of like after all that stuff. It takes place in the future. How far out, we don't know. We don't know if like Dark Knight's Metal will end and then immediately jumps into Doomsday Clock or if there's a span of like a month or two and then Doomsday Clock starts. We just know it takes place in the future. And the reason why we know that is because for the most part, 
the attitude of society has shifted. Where society, you know, previously embraced superheroes, society has basically turned against superheroes. They've turned against Batman. They've turned against Superman. We don't want you guys here. Now, again, we could really attribute this to the aftermath of Dark Knight's Metal, for example. Barbados leading all of his forces into the world, you know, and attacking all the superheroes, all the citizens in Metropolis being converted into Doomsday. Gotham City has really kind of come crashing down during the Gotham Resistance tie-in for Dark Knight's Metal. All those things that are going on, we can really kind of presume that that's when that takes place. But that's all we can do is make that presumption. We don't know with an absolute certainty that that's the case. The other half of this is that Bruce Wayne has basically had to undergo these sort of annual psychological tests, more or less, to satisfy the board of directors. And the reason for this is because of the fact that the board of directors effectively believes that Bruce Wayne is not capable of leading his own company. Now, the reason why this matters is because LexCorp is currently in the process of trying to buy Wayne Enterprises, meaning Lex Luthor would run everything Wayne Enterprises is in charge of. Now, the immediate concern of Lucius Fox, as well as Bruce Wayne, is if this happens, then basically the Batman project will be exposed or it'll have to go underground. But we won't have the resources we have now. Basically, you'll lose all your financial backing, all your gadgets, all your little tricks, all those things. Those will all go out of the way. In truth, it would actually see Batman just kind of return to his to his golden age form back in like the 1930s and 40s when everything was pretty simple and pretty basic. I mean, he still had things like the Batwing, stuff like that. But what it basically means is that Batman would no longer be the sort of fighting force that he would be at the moment. The Bat family would presumably go away. And so Gotham would just kind of be left to whatever criminals really just kind of take it over and run it in its entirety. Bruce's only real concern here is, well, we just need to worry about Batman. We'll worry about that first. We'll, we'll try to figure out a way to keep that, to keep that solvent. But as long as I pass these psychological tests, it doesn't really matter. Picking back up with, you know, Ozymandias, Rorschach, Mime, and Marionette, of course, they crash land in Gotham City. And it's cool, because as they make their way into the city itself, they travel to the public library, they start to notice a lot of similarities, as well as a lot of differences. Now, remember, from the world of the Watchmen, the way that story was written by Alan Moore, it was designed in a lot of ways to be the real world. The Watchmen was designed to be like, what would it be like if heroes existed right now? You wouldn't have Superman flying around, you wouldn't have Green Lanterns, you wouldn't have Wonder Woman or anything like that. The most extreme thing you would have would be a guy like Dr. Manhattan, who gained his powers from an intrinsic field in terms of like superheroes per se, you'd have things like the Minutemen, some group that rose to prominence in 1939. You'd have people who would just be running around as vigilantes, throwing on, you know, makeshift masks and different costumes and so on, and just kind of using whatever training or whatever martial arts they've learned to try to keep the streets safe. And so when you're Ozymandias and you're looking around and you start doing research on the city of Gotham that you're in, as well as the world that you're in, suddenly you start learning about things like Superman. You start learning about things like Wonder Woman. You start learning about things like Green Lantern. You also begin to notice these characters were fictional in your universe. And that's what Ozymandias points out here. In their world, Superman is a fictitious character. He's a comic book superhero. Wonder Woman is a comic book superhero. Green Lantern is a comic book superhero. They've gone from one universe where those characters would pretend to stepping into a universe where they're real. It's very Grant Morrison in terms of how it's done. And it's actually really, really intriguing. But doing some more research and doing some more poking around, in the mind of Adrian Veidt, they can't just go to anyone, right? They can't just go to Wonder Woman or Superman or whoever. What they need are the smartest people. And that's for two different reasons. The first is because those smartest people would be governed by logic and reason. The second is because of the fact that those individuals would be able to help them with whatever resources they need, you know, using their intellect and so on and so forth to help them achieve the goal of tracking down and locating Dr. Manhattan. And so the idea is to split up. Ozymandias himself will go after Lex Luthor and Rorschach will go after Batman. So again, it's cool because what this does is it kind of bounces back and forth between the two. You basically end up having Rorschach who shows up at Wayne Manor, manages to kind of break his way in. And then as he's going through looking for clues and so on, discovers the clock that leads down into the Batcave. And Rorschach descends down into the Batcave and triggers a trap set by Bruce Wayne to alert anybody if anyone enters the cave. From there, it switches over to Ozymandias. Now, this encounter between Ozymandias and Lex Luthor is amazing. It, it, it is so cool. And it's, it's one of the most interesting things out there because remember, with Lex Luthor, he's very arrogant in terms of how he functions and who he is. But remember, assuming this follows the events of Dark Knight's Metal and everything that goes on, and assuming all things being being equal, Lex Luthor's not a bad guy here. Lex Luthor's not a villain. Lex Luthor is a guy who's still a hero, but he's still Lex Luthor. He still considers himself to be the smartest man in the world. He's still very arrogant. He's still full of hubris. He still staunchly believes he's right in everything he does. But notice this, and this is kind of the cool thing. The way that Jeff Johns writes Lex Luthor and the way that Lex Luthor interacts with Ozymandias, you never know he was a good guy. And the reason for that is because you're not supposed to know. If Lex Luthor's written right in DC Comics, you wouldn't know that he was a good guy until he put on a super 
Superman uniform and went to go save the day. And that's why it works. You know, to kind of sidetrack for a second, that's why you can shift back and forth with Lex Luthor. You can have him be a villain when New 52 picks up. You can have him become a good guy during the story of Forever Evil. And then you can have him, you know, stay a good guy after Forever Evil. And the personality remains intact. The arrogance, the hubris, it all stays as a cohesive part of what makes him who he is. Because that's what people like. That's what people like about Lex Luthor. <laughs> They like him being arrogant. They like him being like, yeah, I'm the smartest man in the world. Like, why wouldn't I be? And it's really kind of funny because him and Ozymandias play off of each other. Ozymandias' is an initial answer to the question from Lex Luthor, you know, with regards to who are you is, I'm the smartest man on my world. You're the smartest man on yours. And Lex Luthor is like, okay, well then you're obviously a bonehead. And it's hilarious because what ends up happening is Ozymandias explains everything that happens with regards to the original Watchmen story. And Lex Luthor's response is, and you really thought humanity would stay together? Like you thought that would be the thing that would bring humanity together? You know, you thought that, you know, having some common force and, you know, massive loss of life would be the thing that would unite humanity? Like, if you're the smartest person in the world, I would hate to meet the dumbest person in the world. Now, again, this works beautifully. It works so well because it's this whole idea that Lex Luthor is just like, I mean, that's not how I would have done it. And if it's not how I would have done it, then it was the wrong thing to do. But it's funny the way this exchange is done because it's almost like Jeff Johns basically saying, Ozymandias is so far out of his element. Lex Luthor is so far beyond Ozymandias in terms of who it is that's smarter that it's almost comedic. Speaking of comedic, <laughs> speaking of funny, while the two of them are basically talking to each other, of course, you got Rorschach investigating the Batcave. While the two of them are talking to one another, a shot gets fired in the office of Lex Luthor, only for us to find out that gunshot, that bullet came from the comedian. How he's there, I have no idea. I have no idea how the comedian's back. I have no idea where he came from. I don't even know who he is. And it's just like, no way, no way, dude. I saw that and I was like, Jeff Johns, man, Jeff Johns. Not only that, you end up having Rorschach in the Batcave and he's met by Batman. And Batman's statement is, you ate my breakfast. And Rorschach's statement is, yes, I did. Batman and Rorschach meet each other for the very first time. Time. With that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comments Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.